Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the opening of the exhibition Leave to Land, the Kitchener Camp Rescue 1939, here at the Leo Beck Institute in the Center for Jewish History. I, I'm Markus Kwa, I'm the director of the Leo Beck Institute here, and I'm kind of blown away by the turnout. Um, I mean, this is great. Uh, welcome to everybody who's here. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. Um, I'm, I'm blown away. I, maybe I shouldn't be surprised because obviously the exhibit um, and the topic of the exhibit so richly deserves the attention that you are showing by, by coming and joining us. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful that LBI can present this, this impressive and moving exhibit about the story which um, you may know or may know in greater detail after seeing the exhibit um, about how about 4,000 mostly German Jewish men were saved from Nazi persecution at a camp in Southeast England. And if you took a, a quick view of the exhibit, you will see that it, this exhibit tells their stories, um, beginning with the historical circumstances that led to this um, unique project, uh, all the way to the personal dimension of what it meant to live in Kitchener camp. Um, from the work these men had to do, um, to their desperate efforts to be reunited with their families, the struggles to secure the paperwork for immigration. Um, it tells you about Jewish life in the camp and about its final years when, due to the war, um, German refugees were seen with some suspicion in England at the time. Um, I'm glad that we can present this exhibit because it is very much in line with what the Leo Beck Institute aims to do, and that is to preserve and promote the history of German-speaking Jewry in its entire 1,700-year-long existence, but we do have a focus, as the exhibit has, on the early 20th century, particularly in the 1930s and 1940s. So we try to preserve and promote this history together with the other LBIs in Jerusalem and in London, and here as a proud partner in the Center for Jewish History. We've been doing that for almost 70 years now. The LBI was founded in 1955 in Jerusalem, and we do so based on our archival collection of more than 30,000 collections of family papers and other material, all of which is digitized and easily accessible if you have an internet connection through lectures and book clubs by supporting scholarship on these topics, most recently through our very successful podcast, Exile, and through exhibits like the one you have come to see tonight. I want to thank um, a few people who have made this possible. Um, let me start with Claire Weisenberg for initiating the project. I'm not sure if any of the persons I'm mentioning is in the room, please stand up and uh, get the applause you deserve. So I will just go through my list hoping that somebody is here. Um, I want to thank Ronnie Wolf, who I know is here, for advocating for the exhibit and for serving as an advisor to the project. Um, I want to thank Ort, um, Dan Green, who I think you will see in a video in a moment, um, and Anna Stein, who is also here representing Ort. There you are. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank LBI's curator for exhibits, Mark Robo. You are over there. Thank you. And institutionally, I want to thank the Wiener Library. This exhibit is part of their collection and the Association for Jewish Refugees. And last, but certainly not least, I want to thank the panelists tonight, Emery Aronson, trustee of LBI, who will share her connection to a Kitchener camp. Thank you, Emery. Ronnie Wolf again, who will come to the panel, and LBI senior historian Frank Mecklenburg, who will introduce the exhibit and then moderate the panel. And with that, welcome to you all again, and I think we will see a movie from and about Ort. Um, enjoy the evening. Thank you for coming. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Green. I'm World Ort's Director General and CEO. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to speak to you and send my special greetings from everyone at World Door. We're all so delighted, and thank you to Ronnie Wolf and all of your team for bringing this very, very special exhibition to the US 
there today in the Centre for Jewish History. So pleased so many of you have gone today to speak and listen to the panel and to see the exhibition and many of you online as well. I urge everyone to get there and see it um, and tell all of your friends about it. It's a very special and important part of not just Jewish history, but for us personally at all, it's a very special part of all history. I was somewhat privileged to be um, quite involved with this story around 10 or 12 years ago when I was the director uh, of Orts in the United Kingdom and there was a lot of press and coverage about the Leeds Old Boys. These were 106 students from Berlin who were rescued by my predecessor, a gentleman called Colonel Joseph Henry Levy. He was the director of Orts in, in the UK in 1939. He was spurred on by Lord Rothschild, who was the president of all at the time, to go to Berlin, to march into the corridors of Nazi power at that time and demand visas for all of our students in Berlin. And he managed courageously, heroically, to rescue 106 boys, he brought them through Europe, into England, to the Kitchener camp in Kent, in the southeast of England, where they stayed for three months until a new art school was ready in the northeast of England, in Leeds, um, a place where I was delighted to be involved to get a historic blue plaque on the building so people in Leeds will remember that the building where they stayed, the school where they lived and learned, has some serious historical significance. And I got to know some of the very few, by that point, Leeds old boys who were still alive, who cherished everything that all gave them, who spoke in terms of without or I wouldn't be here today, or saved my life. Um, remarkable people with remarkable legacies, amazing families, and I know they would be so, so proud that you're in some way keeping that story alive. And it's, it's a great opportunity for me just to say a few words about or today, because really that spirit of what happened during the Second World War and during the Holocaust, particularly with Ort's story, is still relevant today in everything that we do. All today is present in 39 countries. We look after tens of thousands of students around the world, supporting them, giving them opportunities in order to go on and, and fulfill and succeed in their lives. And it's such a pleasure whenever I'm traveling around the world to visit our schools and to meet our students and our magnificent teachers, to see that the education that they're giving them, the opportunity that they are getting there, is going to set them up for a really productive uh, life ahead of them. Today we have many challenges in Ort, uh, not least in Israel, where we have 10,000 students. Some of them, we have one school just outside of Ashkelon, eight kilometers from the border with Gaza. Um, many of our students really affected by what happened on October the 7th and uh, the Ort family has has rallied around and really come together, provided millions of dollars of funding to support our students and teachers and their families during this difficult time, providing educational support, psychosocial support, um, transportation to get them away from difficult areas, to set them up in temporary homes or temporary residences. Um, and that support is continuing and ongoing and that need is going to be there for many, many months to come. And similarly, on another front, we have a very difficult situation because of the Russian war in Ukraine. Um, we have 7,000 students in Ukraine, situated in a number of cities in our five schools. And the support, again, that the Ort family has given to, to help those students and their families survive during these difficult times. Even, um, unfortunately, a number of our students have lost fathers who have been fighting in the war, Homes have been destroyed and damaged, and, and our schools even are, are being damaged as well, which is terribly tragic. But the, the glimmer of hope is the love and the support and the unity that we see from the Ort Network. Whenever there is trouble and, di and difficulty, just as there was at that time in 1939, getting boys out of Berlin to England, today we're still helping our students wherever we, we can, we're trying to provide them with better lives and I think we're doing an okay job about it. So once again, thank you for this opportunity. I hope you have a really, really excellent talk today. I'm sorry I can't be with you, um, but all the very, very best. Have a great time.
Hello. Welcome, and I'm so happy to see you. I'm Frank Mecklenburg, the senior historian of the Leobeck Institute. And uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, people who have also contributed to the uh, building of the exhibit, um, several among you, and uh, uh, that is uh, all a common effort that uh, has succeeded so well. Um, I wanted to point out the larger context here in that the kitchen camp story is a detail in a vast universe of uh, World War II and the Holocaust. And yet, we are talking about several thousand uh, of people affected by the Nazi policies and the consequences resulting from the reactions of the rest of the world. After many decades of research and publishing about the Holocaust with thousands and thousands of studies, reports, interviews, documentaries, and so on, many questions remain unanswered. And only now, in recent years, are we coming to the individual stories. That is where the connection, the connections are to be made to our own lives today and what is going on around the world. 1938 was a turning point in the immigration policy. Between 1933 and 1938, immigration functioned with Palestine as the major immigration country. But then in March of 1938, the occupation of Austria by the Germans uh, increased the, popu the Jewish population of Germany and the prospect of being persecuted and thus also the increase in immigration. And, but countries around the world were no longer willing to accept refugees. The summer conference of Evian in July did address the issues, but without a solution. The Munich Agreement in, at the end of September, um, which was to bring peace to, a dangerous ten to the dangerous tensions, was followed by a few days later uh, with the occupation of the Czech borderlands, the Sudetenkrise. The major escalation came with Kristallnacht which finally signaled that Germany was not going to relent. On the one hand, the November violent and murderous attack on the Jews in Germany signaled the end of the possibility of Jews to live in Germany. On the other hand, it was a repeat of the March attacks in Vienna on, on the nationwide scale, finally for the world to realize what was going on nationwide. But only very few countries offered help. The UK was the only country willing to offer larger scale help within a few weeks after Kristallnacht. Beginning of December, UK agreed to take unaccompanied children, known as kinder transport, eventually 10,000 of them. LBI, the Leobeck Institute, has on its website the documentation of the 1938 exhibit from 2018 that we did at the anniversary and the kinder transport exhibit in, uh, we have the 1938 exhibit in, in 2018, and then the kinder transport exhibit in 2019. And both of these exhibits can still be viewed um, on the website uh, of the Leobeck Institute. But we should not forget the conditions under which 
kinder transport was allowed to happen, including substantial financial guarantees in advance, limited time of stay that is not knowing what would follow as of September 1, 1939, with the break out of the war. And not all children were lucky to find welcoming host families. Kinder transport was organized by the German Emergency Committee of the Society of Friends, the Quakers. The Kinder Transport Project gained public recognition in recent years, but many other non-governmental and private initiatives are still unknown. In England, there was, for instance, also Youth Aliyah, uh, a training camp organized by the Orthodox community with the goal to go to Palestine. And there are many other examples that are also of the scale of what we are talking about here. The Kitchener camp story is known thanks to Dr. Claire Weissenberg, who I hope has a chance to uh, listen tonight from London. Her father was one of the 4,000 men. Claire worked with the Wiener Library in London, where the exhibit was shown in 2019 and which created this traveling exhibit uh, that you will see in the upstairs gallery. So now I want to take another step and invite our two panelists here up to the stage so that we can get to the very personal level. Um, and um, first, Ronnie Wolf, um, who is, aside from the initiator of all of this, um, an interior designer and a glass artist. Her father was an art student in Berlin and came to the UK in 1939, right? And Emery Aronson, who is a LBI board member, and she is a ch the chief knowledge officer and senior advisor to the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, a community organization in New York that fights against poverty and deals with communal community issues. Um, she also is the daughter of refugees from Germany. Her father came to Orts to Berlin as by way of kinder transport to UK and um, uh, Horst Aronson, her father, was also featured in the Kinder Transport exhibit that we had here in 2019. So please come up. And Ronnie is uh, giving her thanks to get started. Good evening and welcome. I'd like to give a special shout out to the Kitchener descendants who have joined us here tonight, online and in the room. Will the Kitchener descendants please raise their hands? I've dreamt about this evening at the Leo Beck Institute since September 1st, 2019, when the Leave to Land exhibition opened in London's Jewish Museum. In the gallery sat Kitchener descendants from around the world. Many, like myself, had only recently discovered their connection to the Kitchener camp. I'm most grateful to Frank Mecklenburg, who always took my calls when he knew I'd be pestering him about a date to mount the exhibition and to Magna Robel, who had worked with me on the details needed to undertake this endeavor. Warm regards to the team of archivists at ORT and respectfully Dan Green, Director General and CEO of World ORT, whom I met in New York City at ORT's 100th Anniversary Gala. 
At my suggestion, Ort agreed to join the Kitchener exhibition by creating a panel detailing how Ort was involved with educating and saving the lives of 106 Berlin Ort students and eight staff members who accompanied them to England. My dad, Gerhard Wolf, but known to us as Gary, was one of those Ort students. Don't forget to scan the QR code that you'll see in the exhibition next to the panels. It will bring you to the enlightening Kitchener website. It's nice to see you all and enjoy the evening. So we have a, we have a few minutes to go into further detail. And actually, I maybe with you, Amory, I, I would love to hear how did you even learn? When did you learn first about your father's adventures? Um, happy to do that, but I also want to add some acknowledgments and thanks because uh, um, I think this is just so important. So I have five of them, five sets of them. <laughs> first, to uh, thank you to Frank, to Marcus, to Magda, to Monica, to everybody at LBI who was really instrumental in making this happen, and then to the uh, partners in, at ORT for doing this. Second, to Ronnie, who this was my first introduction to Ronnie, and boy, do I have so much to learn from her. She's been such an incredible guide, because this is gonna be, and I'll do a very small part of my father's story, but it's so important. Um, the third is I want to acknowledge that somewhere out in the virtual world, well, actually in Florida is my brother, <laughs> and so, uh, Rich, so uh, when I speak about my dad in a few minutes. I just want to say that it's both of our fathers. It's a he was father to both of us, and and I just get the chance to share it. But these are I'm sharing our common memories of my dad. Um, fourth, any time my dad went to a gathering of of you know, refugees who had been through England, and they would talk about their experiences, he would always stand up and say. I think we really need to be grateful to the British people for taking us in. And they would, he got a lot of pushback for that and because everybody would say, our experiences weren't that great. And, and it was really difficult. And it's not that my dad had an easy time, as I'll tell you in a few minutes. He had a really tough time, but never would he ever say that. He viewed life as an adventure and he, and he would say, it was an experience, we had to do it, it was better, and, and truthfully, it was better than what the alternative was, because he was born in Germany, it was better than the alternative. And so, I, in honor of him, I actually do have to say thank you to the British people for taking in those 10,000 children, um, because my dad was on the kinder transport. And finally, I wanna thank everybody in the room um, these are really important stories, and everybody online, these are just really important stories to keep alive, particularly in these times. Frank, you were talking about the messages for today. Um, and I know that my father would have been so pleased to know that there's an exhibit about Kitchener Camp and that this, that this has its place in, in the history. So now I'll answer your question. Yes. <laughs> but so, my dad was born in, in February uh, 1923 in the town of Braunschweig, which is outside of Hanover and about 60 kilometers from Berlin. His dad was an engineer. He thought he was, he knew he was gonna grow up to be an engineer, although at one point he thought he, was, he wanted to be a theoretical mathematician. And, um, and as you're gonna hear, he was an incredible optimist. I mean, he was a really an optimist. I wish I had that level of optimism. And so he would tell us when we, that he's like, I always knew I wanted to come to America. And he never sort of blinked at the fact that it was a really difficult journey to get here, but because it was, it was gonna be great. This is where I wanted to be. Not long after his bar mitzvah, um, he was, his parents sent him to Berlin because he couldn't stay in his hometown anymore. He was the only Jewish kid in his high school and things were difficult. And there he learned to be a, uh, a, a, mach a machinist. Um, and I just wanna put a pin in that 
because that's the first trade he's going to learn in this journey. Um, and he spent some time as a courier for some of the agencies that, are, that were in Berlin. And as 1936 turned to 37, to, to 38, he was doing a lot of work for something he always called the committee. And Frank, thank you for that introduction because I now know that the committee was the Quakers. Um, and uh, because he, he was working for the groups that, were, that started organizing the kinder transport. And that's how he got on one of the, the kinder transport when he was about 15. Um, and he and, uh, and his best friend at the time were on, his, a man named Hans Arnstein, who was uh, killed in the Normandy invasion. Uh, he, the two of them got on the, the transport together and arrived in Dover Court in England. A few weeks, uh, a few months after they're in, uh, in, in Dover Court, they're teen boys, they're not easily placed, and about 70 of them, I think it says, about 70 of them ended up going to, uh, either they volunteered or they were shipped off to, uh, to Kitchener Camp to help build it because this was a run down World War I facility. And so they were making it hab habitable. And my father always told this story about how they had put all this work into building the camp and just the day they were gonna see their very first movie in the rec hall, they got shipped out <laughs> because they were too young. And so he ended up at Chiltern Immigrant Training Colony, which was part farm for, it was a farm, part for refugee boys, part for juvenile delinquent boys. And, uh, and by the way, while he was there, he learned to be a blacksmith. So that was trade number two he got. Um, but I know for certain that my dad was at Kitchener camp. And how do I know that? Because I have this book. And this is a book about, it's a conversational English book. And stamped in it, it says, Kitchener camp. And then in his handwriting, it says, it has his name in it. And so I never knew, did he swipe the book? Was it given to him? <laughs> because I didn't find it until after he passed away. So. We knew he was there, he told us uh, that he was there, but, it, but there, that and, and there's this other book I have, which is in English, a book of Jewish thoughts that he got when he arrived in Dover Court. And clearly this was so important to him that he not only kept them while he was in England, he brought them with him as he got to the United States and he kept them over all of these years. Um, they, they were a crucial part of his history and something he talked about um, and, and something that was, that was really, really important. And just to, to finish out my dad's story, just so that you know the, the, the end of it. And by the way, conversational English in 1938 is really interesting because they have a whole section on the wireless and how you should, um, how, if you're going to London, what it is that you should do, go to the theater. You can get tickets, don't worry, go to the theater. Um, so just to speed through the rest of his story is, he got to New York in 1940, he arrived with $8 to his name, uh, went to high school at night, was drafted in 43, became a citizen before he was shipped out, was in the Army Corps of Engineers in a new unit called Amphibious Engineers, uh, where he was in the Pacific. In other words, he actually operated a landing craft um, in the Pacific and learned trade number three to be a, a mechanic. And then when he got out in 46, and here's our fun fact, he came back to, new, to the States on the Intrepid which is parked in the harbor. Um, he, uh, he went to college on the GI Bill and then to graduate school and became an engineer. Uh, but by the 1960s, he, uh, he felt that he was not, he didn't have a chance to see his kids enough. That's my brother and me. And, um, and he was really not sure that what he wanted to do was all that defense contract work, and, which is what engineers did. And so he became a college professor and he taught engineering to um, engin in engineers and architects. Uh, he, 
my father was a really good man. He was a really kind man. He was the most loyal friend you could want. He was incredibly patient, and as my sister-in-law always said of him, he never met a stranger he didn't know. And so it's such a treat to be here to, in fact, get a chance to honor his memory in this way. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Very interesting. I'll let you talk. And you, Ronnie, I'm sure have, you have a different story. My, my story is very different. Yeah. Um, first of all, my dad died in 1971, and all we knew at that time was that he was from Charlottenburg, a very nice uh, suburb of Berlin, and that 28 members of his uh, family had passed away. His older sister had gotten to Palestine because she was um, married and they left in 36. And, uh, and his other sister and mother, uh, father and aunt also got out, but after the war had started and um, from different ports. And uh, in 2009 is when I found a postcard written to my father from his father um, saying that he was about to board a ship to America and that they would do a thousand, they would do whatever they could to bring him to them, a uh, thousand kisses, Vati, daddy. But it was written, uh, when, I, when I studied the postcard, I only saw the red uh, address on it, which said, Ort Technical School Leeds, England. I hadn't seen the original um, address, which was addressed to Kitchener Camp, until many years later. But in 2009, um, Google had just kind of come out, and my, I said to my husband, where's Leeds? And he says, I don't know, Google it. <laughs> so that's what I did, and there, on the first page was my dad at 16 years old standing in front of their lead school with a handful of his classmates. So, what more? <laughs> and what about Kitchener? Hmm. Okay, so, um, uh, hmm. well, most of his story uh, I know about Kitchener from a diary that was found in 2012 that he typed from 1933 to 1940. And I had Frank um, translate it for us. The one thing that I was given as a nine-year-old was a typewriter. Now I know why. <laughs> they found typing very important back in the day. Um, on the Kitchener website, there are 10 pages about his time at Kitchener camp. And uh, I encourage you all to look up Gerhard Wolf and read about their time at Kitchener. Thank you. <laughs> Did I say that Rabbi Leo Beck was his rabbi? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the reason I felt compelled that this exhibition must be here, must be shown here, was that my dad's rabbi was De uh, Rabbi Leo Beck. It's amazing. <laughs> but that's not the only reason why it should be here. Yes, that's um, true. But. Because this is the place where all aspects of German-speaking Jewish history is uh, being preserved and, uh, and uh, made available. And so from these two very different stories, I think there are probably lots of other stories out there um, and um, if you don't know where to go with it, um, you know this is definitely this is definitely the place uh, where these things will be uh, recognized and also then made available for future generations interested in these things. Um, I also like to mention that there's a book uh, written by uh, Claire Ungerson on the 4,000 Lives Saved. Um, you can buy it on Amazon, and it tells all about the Kitchener camp, so. Yeah. Let me just say one, one more thing. Um, from these two very different individual stories, 
Um, and that is actually about a very small uh, segment of time, the time at Kitchener camp. Um, you know, we, we can see that it is important to learn about all these individual stories. In the past, there was always this notion that there are many people and there's many big things going on, but how do we, how to relate all of these stories to our children and grandchildren? I think these are the stories that will make it possible for them to relate to this and um, also to make the connection to things that are happening today. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to Ort. Um, Dad ended up being in D-Day and um, going all through um, uh, the war. He, he returned back to um, uh, New York City in December of 45. But due to his Ort skills, he was in the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, he was a welder and he specialized in electricity as well. So. What Ronnie and I have discovered is that our fathers had sort of parallel lives in the most amazing way. Um, it, it's been fascinating. But Frank, to your point, can I just read a quote that I actually got out of the, uh, out of the Unger book that you recommended, Ronnie, um, and the relevance to today? In it, it explains that uh, that as they were setting up Kitchener Camp, they these were the instructions that were given, and uh, and so I'm just going to read it. Uh, sort of the preconditions for the camp, and it says. He understands further that the council will give a collective guarantee that persons admitted to this country for the purpose of going to the camp would not take any employment in this country unless a special permit was obtained and would not be a public charge and would as far as possible migrate within a year. So like we use those exact same words now about what it means for, for immigrants and migrants coming to, to New York. And, and so if we want to know what is the connection between then and now, it is very clear. And, and it would be great if we actually learned something from it. Well, and then maybe <laughs> just as a concluding, I mean, we know now um, what happened in 1938 and afterwards, and uh, you know what historians lately are um, fancying is the what if story and uh, we could construct now a scenario where we would say what would have happened if um, after um, March of 1938, countries around the world would have accepted Jewish refugees from Germany. And uh, the course of history might have been different, but um, unfortunately we don't have hindsight available to us. So. But I want to open this for some questions or a brief, please. Now, just a technical question. If you're looking, is there a roster of names for time? Is there going to be a way to, so I have two people that I'm looking for that might, well, there's two people I'm looking for that I might, might be part of, have been part of Kitchener, two men that would have been the right age, but from Vienna. So were there men from Vienna? I thought there were men from Vienna as well. So is there going to be some roster of every name that was in Kitchener? I, I can answer that. So there isn't a roster. There is a Kitchener website that families have entered their family name on, into the website. Um, that's... David? Oh, yeah. Yep. So you enter the name, but... No, the, you should use the internet. Okay. One thing is to look at this website okay. and ask the question, but there are other discussion groups um, where if you put out your, your quest, I mean, there are lots of people around the world who are reading this, and you may be lucky that somebody in Australia will be able to make the connection. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
my grandfather, Rudolf Schaffernick, was one of the men from Vienna who was at the Kitchener camp. Um, and there is, if you go on the website, his name is on there. I didn't enter it, so I don't know how all the data got there, but you're likely to be able to check whether that name is there. And I'm his only descendant, so um, I don't know how his name got on that list, but it is, so I would definitely check. But I'm interested, my grandfather um, was uh, one of the men who was arrested on the streets of Vienna and taken to Dachau and then Buchenwald and was able to get released because he was going to leave the country and got to Kitchener. So it's, it very much saved his life. And I'm wondering um, if you can just tell us a little bit more about what his experience may have been like and also wh what percentage of the men in Kitchener had been in the concentration camps in those, in those early stages of I don't know whether the research on this has actually gotten that far. Um, and I just want to emphasize again, I mean, the topic of Kitchener camp is something that has not entered the public sphere that long ago. Uh, we know a lot about concentration camps. We know by now fairly much about kinder transport. Um, and various other rescue efforts. But um, Kitchener is something that um, really does need more input. And so I think your question is actually more valuable in a certain way than any answers, because it will, it will bring other people to the idea that there is a lot out there that needs to be still established on, on getting the story to So them. speaking of, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So just to follow up and a plug for LBI, after my father died, I found a vast uh, collection of papers of my grandfather's, including those that exist about Kitchener, and we have donated them to LBI. And I, if anybody else is here, I encourage you to do the same. So we, you've, you. got what I, you've got more than what I know. Thank you. Yeah, just, I just want to acknowledge that um, those of you who are online can uh, use the Q&A function as well to join the conversation. And a few, speaking of answers, a few have trickled in, including from Claire Weisenberg, who's joining us online. Um, so just- Thank you. Uh, in, res in response to just the last few questions, um, Claire and uh, Peter Heilbrunn online both note that um, the names, uh, uh, listed on the website come from a national census that was conducted in September 1939. Um, Claire also notes, um, so that's about 3,500 names that are on the Kitchener Camp website, and um, about a third of the refugees there were from Vienna, according to Claire. Um, so if you're online, you want to ask a question, just type it into the Q&A, but we've got another one in the room here. Yeah, there was first there. Hi, thank you. Um, my, it's beautiful to hear you speak. Thank you so much for what you've said. Oh, I just said thank you for everything you've said and how beautiful your stories are. But I also wanted to ask a question. My dad never understood, nor did his, nor did any of his friends who kept in touch with his entire life, who were among the boys that went to Kitchener camp. On, of those 106, he and his friends never understood how their fathers or their families made contact with whatever he didn't know, so I don't know. How did they find out about this situation where they could actually put the boys somewhere in some list that would allow them to get out, to be one of the 106. How did that happen? Does anybody know? I believe that Colonel Levy um, from Ort uh, took it upon himself to actually, uh, he, get, he got dressed up in his Scottish uh, kilt. He went to Berlin um, and he knocked on doors and he actually 
uh, offices were already closed and he, he found somebody who had a way to get into one of the offices with the stamp. And uh, that is the way that they got out. I don't, you know, um, uh, Ort worked very hard with the Central uh, British Fund to find, you had to find a space. And fortunately, there was enough room at Kitchener to accommodate these children. So um, that's what I know. And we should also point out that there were, of course, a number of other organizations that helped in this. Um, there are two people here from the American Joint Distribution Committee, um, and they were another organization, very important, long established, meaning that they had also the networks to inform each other and others and uh, these refugee and aid organizations knew from each other and, and would collaborate on these matters. And the joint actually supported these, this ORT school in Leeds. As it did the kinder transport. <laughs> That's uh, correct. My father-in-law was one of the uh, Kitchener uh, boys or men, uh, and I've, for a long time I've wondered, how, do, how do th were these uh, uh, men selected? Where did they come from? Were they in concentration camps? How did they get picked? There were an awful lot of people that would have wanted this opportunity. So how did these p particular guys get picked? Many of them had skills. These were tradesmen. Uh, these were plumbers and woodworkers. Um, these were not the rich and fancy men of the day. These were men who could help rebuild uh, Kitchener Camp. I'm talking, not talking about the group that came to build the camp. I'm talking about the men that were that were plucked, of the 4,000 that were plucked. My my father-in-law was definitely not a skilled worker. Uh, he he came from someplace. And I, I've always wondered how did how did he get to be yeah. one of the books. Well, one one part of the story that that also needs to be inserted here is between 1933 and actually before until that time after 1938 came, there were five years in which the Jewish community in, in Central Europe um, organized. And they were very skilled organizers who built connections, who made contacts. I know of actually one research project that is only now coming to light that these, organ these long established organizations, the Zentralverein, which was the central organization of Jews in Germany, they actually had established already in the 1920s, definitely in the late 1920s, contacts to American Jewish organizations. So there were connections there, but we are also learning about these things only now the internet has helped greatly in facilitating these, these, these connections that are, when you asked how were these people uh, sort of uh, selected, it's between connections and serendipity. Um, it's, it's impossible to determine how is individual, why were they in or and why were they not, there's a lot of chance in all of this, uh, which, as Emory was saying, which is how are all of these efforts operating today? And um, a lot of people just don't get a chance. So uh, just a little bit more information uh, and commentary from online. Claire mentions that the oldest half of ORT was sent out first, the younger half was supposed to follow. Uh, but the outbreak of war prevented the second half leaving, and it's believed that all but two of the younger half were killed in the Holocaust. In the archives of the aid agency, there were months of discussion um, about getting all the boys out, but the British government wanted the machinery out with the boys. Um, there were very specific reasons men were picked. Some had family connections in the aid agencies, some were fraternity members, and those networks helped. German Jewish training camps were another significant factor. 
Um, uh, thank you so much, Claire. We, we wish you could be here uh, to answer in person, but um, of course we'll also have a chance to look at the exhibit shortly. Uh, I think we have another question here from the audience. There was one, there was one other question earlier here, maybe. Or, well, let's start the last two questions, yeah. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for bringing this fascinating story to the forefront. Um, the Kitchener camp was for boys, and I presume it was for boys that were on the kinder transport that had no uh, sponsors in England. My mother, who is still alive, who will was a, a young girl who was on the kinder transport and she was one of the last uh she was on it nine days before uh hitler invaded poland and she was blessed to have cousins in england that took her in and her great aunt traveled very long story but helped my mother fill out the application uh where my mother was hiding in belgium but is there an equivalent of a Kitchener camp for females, for women that did not have any connection to England? No, there's that it is not. However, there was also the um, ability to work as a domestic. And um, many women, but also men, uh, came to England and worked in some household, um, lucky or not, depending on the conditions. That was another aspect of how some people got out. So one, one last question here, and then afterwards we can converse more upstairs in, in the exhibit. Uh, good evening, this is, as a child of Holocaust survivors, I'm deeply touched by all of this. I did not know of the existence of the Kitchener camp. I thought I had read everything since I was a teenager and I'm now a retiree. But there is so much more uh, information coming out. My question is approximately, out of all of the men who went through the Kitchener camp, how many came to the United States? How many came to Israel? And how many were allowed for one reason or another to stay in England? And how many might have gone to Western Europe? That sounds like a very nice uh, MA thesis uh, <laughs> to, uh, to find out. And yeah, no, what you were saying, you have been reading for many, many years, and when, you, and when you look at what is being published these days and what people are writing, and I know several people here in the audience who are working on, on these stories, um, it's amazing all the individual uh, stories that are coming to light now. The last one. I would like to say that um, it didn't fare well for everybody who got to Kitchener camp. Um, most men were classified as uh, friendly aliens. Some were not. And what happened is, is I can only speak about Ort, but 40 of the Ort students, because they were German, it didn't matter that they were Jewish, they were placed on the ship, the Denera, which was sent uh, to Australia, and they were interned for 18 months, uh, 19 months, sorry. Um, so there's all kinds of stories. Many of these men joined the Pioneer Corps. Um, those that got to America may have joined the U.S. Army. There are some that got to Canada. Some um, men were on ships that were going to be sent to internment camps that were sunk, and some were sent to the Isle of Man. So. You have a lot more to learn. <laughs> Many more stories. Thank you to all three of you, and I want to thank um, all of you um, who are here in the room and who joined us online again um, for sharing your stories.
needed tonight for important project uh, for, for entering data, for sharing stories on the internet, the various ways in which this story is being compiled. And for all those of us who um, sometimes can think of history as something that is written in books and uh, described on panels of exhibits, thank you for reminding us that behind every panel, on every page of those history books, there is living and breathing persons who were in many cases your ancestors, parents, grandparents, parents-in-law. Um, I think this was a wonderful opportunity to remind everybody um, of this. I hope it was a good opportunity for you to engage with your family history. I'm glad that the Biomec Institute can provide a framework for that and I'm particularly glad that this is not the end of the conversation, not tonight, because we can continue talking at this session of theirs, which is great. And I hope that we can continue those conversations in many other ways. Thank you for coming.